गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग ओके सो इन द लास्ट क्लास वी वर डिस्कसिंग जस्ट मिनट लेट मी रिकॉर्ड दी In the last class, I have given you a problem uh, stating that I think somebody is there in the waiting room. See, <coughs> okay. So uh, I think we have seen this problem. Okay. So um, in this problem. Uh, i about the you know, second moment area about x axis passing through o and moment of inertia about y axis passing through o is known to you so now i want to calculate the uh, moment of inertia of this cross section about an axis passing through its centroidal axis okay so let us say this is icx and icy okay so let me calculate one by one I C X Y is I C X is equal to, um, or otherwise I can put I, I can use parallax theorem and I can say uh, I C X Y, sorry I C O X is equal to I C X plus A into Y bar square. Okay, I O X that is moment of inertia about its uh, uh, centroidal axis is given as I O X is What seven point six five into ten to the power six. So seven point six five into ten to the power six is equal to I C X. The moment of inertia of this element is not known. Uh, coming to the cross section area, the, what is the cross section area? The cross section area A is equal to. Uh, can any one of you please tell me the cross section area of the total element? Sixteen to eight is four eighty. Four eighty plus. Um, Eight sixteen, twelve ninety six. Is it correct? Twelve ninety six into y bar is thirty eight point six three. Okay, so this implies I C X is equal to yes. Yes. Seven point six five into ten to the power of six is equal to I C X plus twelve ninety six into thirty eight point six three holes. Yes. Sir, uh, someone is waiting in the lobby. Can you? Yes. What is ICX? See, anyone is calculating or not? Simply you are sitting, idle. Yes. Your voice is breaking, Amma. Your voice is breaking. Seven sixty-five into ten power four, sir. Ah, uh, seven point six five into ten to the power six. No change with this. No, sir. Huh? Twelve ninety-six into thirty-eight point six three square. See thirty-eight into thirty-eight. It's roughly it is the uh, forty into forty sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred is a point one six into ten to the power six. Point one two into ten to the power four. No, there will be some change. Please calculate it. So it is five seventy four into ten power four, sir. Five point seven four into ten to the power six. 
yes and my power four okay so always uh, you require less energy to rotate a section about an axis passing through its center right because about any other axis plus a h square term comes into the picture h cannot be zero is it not so remember that so you, if you apply the load away from the center of gravity of the cross section the buckling tendency increases okay yes then what is icy is equal to uh or let me put the equation i o y is equal to i c y plus a into x bar square okay so i o y is i think 0.25 into 10 to the power of 6 i think it is 0.25 4.5 into 10 to the power 6 10 to the power 6 is equal to i c y plus 1296 into x bar square x bar square is 13.63 okay so implies icy is equal to sir few people are in lobby it's allowed them okay Yes, what is its value? I C Y is equal to four point two six into ten power six. Four point two into ten power six. Ten to the power six mm power four. Okay, so let me calculate I O X Y. O X Y is equal to I C X Y plus A into X bar Y bar. Okay, so this implies I O X Y. Already I have found out what is this value? Its value is um, zero point two five into ten to the power six. Okay, zero point two five into ten to the power six is equal to I C X Y plus twelve ninety six into um, 13.63 is x bar y bar is um, 38.63 okay so what is the value of icxy minus 0 0.43 into 10 power 6 Minus 0 0.43 into 10 to the power 6 mm power 4. See, so it I can see. be negative value also. Sir. Yes, yes, it can be negative value also. I see product of inertia can be a positive value or negative value. Don't worry about it. Okay, so let us calculate the um, moments of inertia passing through the centroids. Okay, so that is uh, IC1 is equal to ICX plus i c y by 2 plus square root of i c x minus i c y by 2 whole square plus i c x y square okay so you have to remember this formula i think remembering this formula is not a big issue okay now so this value is i c x is um, let me put 10 to the power 6 here so that um, this is 4.2 and this is 5.74 5.74 plus 4.20 by 2 plus square root of 5.74 minus 4.20 by 2 whole square plus minus 0.43 whole square Okay, very close. So, what is uh, I C one?
Yes. Five point nine to ten plus six. Yes, please. Five point nine four into ten to the power six mm power four. Okay, so I C two is now simply what is generally what is that I will do is I X X plus I Y Y is I C X. I C one plus I C two. Okay, so what is that? I will say I C X plus I C Y minus I C one is nothing but I C X two. That is ten uh, to the power six into I C X plus I C Y is five point seven four plus four point two zero minus five point nine four. What is this value? Sir, four into ten power six. Pardon? Four into ten power six, sir. Okay. So uh, let me see if anyone is present in the. Okay. So like this, you can calculate the. Mm, principal moments of inertia about the axis passing to the centroid. Okay, so how you have to solve the problem? So practice tells you. Okay, now let us uh, calculate the uh, tan two alpha. That is the inclination of the principal axis. It is given by minus I C X Y divided by I C X Y I C X minus I C Y. By two, is it not? This is the formula. So, minus of the minus point um, is this four three into ten to the power six divided by I C X is five point seven four minus four point two zero by two into ten to the power six. This this cancels. So, what is tan two alpha? What is alpha one, alpha two? Yes, what is tan al two alpha? Point five six sir. Zero point five six. Okay. Mm. Then what is alpha one? Point Yes, what is alpha one? Class level one master. Na eleven ko thundi, mali na kalu ki vary class ni. Yes, what is alpha one?
Okay. So is there anyone who is calculating it? Pardon? Alpha one is fourteen point five seven. Uh, is it two alpha or alpha? Sir, alpha sir, fourteen point five seven. Fourteen point five seven degrees. Okay, alpha two is equal to alpha one plus ninety. So that is equal to one zero four point five seven degrees. Okay. So which plane carries the maximum principal stress, minimum principal stress? We have to mention. Okay. So this is the section. See, you come across this type of cross sections in civil engineering very frequently. Okay. So lot of uh, sections are available. Okay. Yeah. In design of steel sections, you'll have a steel table. Okay. So which gives you the properties of different properties of the cross sections. Okay. So you come across very frequently this uh, sections. So please pay attention. I X X C Y. Okay. So now your alpha one is fourteen point five seven degrees. Fourteen point five seven degrees means there is something. This is your alpha one. Let me put alpha one here. Okay, so perpendicular to this, this is what is this inclination? Fourteen point five seven degrees. Let us say. Okay, so perpendicular to this ninety degrees alpha two, which is nothing but one at four degrees fifty seven minutes. One at four point five seven degrees. Okay, so now the question is: This alpha one carries which principal moment of inertia? Will it carry five point nine four or four point zero six? That is important. Okay, so look here. This ICX carries a moment of inertia of seven point. It's not seven point six five. It is five point four. Is it not? What is this value? Five point seven four. Into ten to the power six, whereas this IC by E carries four point two into ten to the power six moment of inertia of this. Okay, so this alpha is this axis is nearer to this alpha one. So therefore, this axis carries um, this axis carries maximum principal moment of inertia. That is uh, what is the maximum principal moment of inertia? Five point nine four into ten to the power six. Okay, so alpha two is the other one. That is four uh, into ten to the power six. Four point zero eight six. You may have a doubt that, sir, if this angle is forty five degrees, then what is that we have to do? Okay. Then substitute in the equation, verify. Okay. So this is the way how you are supposed to calculate the what are the various things we have discussed. Let me list out second moment of area. Product of inertia. Parallax theorem, perpendicular axis theorem, second moment area of composite figures, and then principal moments of inertia. Principal moment. 
So these are the things that were covered. Of course, the same can be extended even for three-dimensional objects also. But for civil engineering uh, things, we rarely come across three-dimensional objects. So let us not put much emphasis on it. Those who want to study, just you can go through with the literature. Just it's only calculus. Okay. Uh, with the help of calculus, you can, or using parallax theorem or perpendicular axis theorem, you can get the information about those things. Okay. So this is about the statics. So far, we have discussed several things in statics. Okay. So the static principles are the equilibrium concepts we have seen, two-dimensional systems we have seen, three-dimensional systems we have seen. We have seen how to calculate moment of a force about a point, about an axis, which is in dimension. Uh, just a minute. Okay. So we have seen uh, the the use of this moment of a force about a point in determining the uh, or in arriving at the equilibrium equations. Okay. So like that, we have seen several things with reference to three dimension as well as two dimension. Okay. So this completes the principles of statics. So you are having the principles of dynamics in your syllabus. Okay, so uh, this is about the statics. So we are having in the syllabus statics dynamics as well as part of strength of materials. Okay, so I want to put statics and strength of materials together. Okay, so the reason is because uh, for civil engineers, more of uh, statics principles and strength of materials principles are important than the principles of dynamics because uh, rarely the civil engineering structures are subjected to vibrations, especially in dynamics. Okay, uh, dynamics means structural dynamics or you can say the earthquake engineering. There, rarely you come across this. Okay, so therefore, uh, we will concentrate strength of materials aspect of it. Is it clear? Yes? Is it clear or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so we will take up the strength of materials aspect. Sir, some students are waiting. See, somebody is putting emojis. Please don't do it. The word I said please means I'm irritated of it. Means. Okay. Don't do it. Okay. So now we will take up the strength of materials aspect of it. Strength of materials, uh, it gives you, it, it slightly deviates from engineering mechanics. Okay. Um, Okay, so look here, in engineering mechanics, the basic assumption is the body is rigid. Okay, so assumption body is rigid means uh, there is no distinction whether it is a fluid or a gas or a semi-solid, solid, whether the solid contains water or not. Okay, so because the soil masses, sometimes they contain water. Okay, so for the engineering mechanics, there is no distinction as such. But in general, the bodies are not rigid. 
Okay, so discontinuities will be there. Means cavities, voids will be there. So therefore, um, you have to relax the assumption of rigid body. So once you relax the assumption of rigid body, then it becomes flexible body, or you can't say it is flexible body. It is deformable body. Deformable body mechanics. It is called. Okay, this is very very important for civil engineers especially because without the principles of understanding the strength of materials, you cannot step in into any of the design because the strength of materials tells you the principles of failure of the body also when a body fails. Okay, those principles also we will be knowing strength of materials. So that's why. The strength of materials is uh, we can't we can say it is a heart of civil engineering. So without the knowledge of strength of materials, you cannot move even an inch in civil engineering. Okay, so therefore deformable bodies again is divided into two parts: continuously deformable bodies. Okay, so continuously deformable bodies are again converted into two categories: gases, liquids. Okay, so uh, this aspects will be studied by fluid mechanics people. The principles of this will be understood in fluid mechanics. Okay, so there is one course in fluid mechanics that you will be learning later. Okay, so this is. Deformable body, continuously deformable bodies are this. That means they do not resist shear stress. They are called fluid. So, a student is waiting. See, at this time, if he comes to the class, how can he expect that? If there is an internet issue, I can understand. But it's not an internet issue, is it not? It's only sluggishness. So she got disconnected by mistake. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the bodies that do not resist to shear stress are called fluids. Okay. And that mechanics is called fluid mechanics. Of course, fluid mechanics is uh, further divided into liquids as well as gases. Let us not worry about that, because the chemical engineers they think about this. But as far as the civil engineering is concerned, or uh, in strength of materials, we discuss the bodies which resist shear stress, or the bodies that they come under. Solids and it is called solid mechanics. Okay, so the solid mechanics is also further divided into several categories. Let us not worry about that. Okay, so they, they have become the topic of the courses. Okay, so so the solid mechanics you can say it is strength of materials. Okay, so now we will see the principles of this strength of materials. In strength of materials. The body is subjected to, if, say for example, if you are having a body, let me put it in. Uh, uh, let me consider a body, three-dimensional body, so that all of you are familiar with the different types of forces that will be acting on it. Say, for example, if I take a body like this, uh, let me say it is fixed here. Okay, so this body can be subjected to axial force like this. Means uh, hold a body, pull the force, pull the pull it. This is called axial force. Okay. So the axial force, this is a tension. If I put it in the opposite direction, it is compression. So the tendency of this force is to 
increase the internal distance between two particles. Okay, so the distance between these two particles increases with the application of this force P. It is what really happens. If it is a rigid body, this distance is constant. The internal distance between two particles remains constant if it is a rigid body. But in strength of materials, we can see that, that the forces are responsible for the increase in the internal distance between the particles. Okay, say for example, uh, because I have put it in three dimension, if I apply force like this, this is called shear force because it is a tangential force. Tangential is nothing but shear. Okay, shear force. And what is what we, it will do? I'll tell you later. Okay, so because easily you can understand, I have put the axial force. Okay, and then you can have the pier force on this plane in this direction. This is also called pier force. Both the shear forces are same. Okay, so generally to say that this is a horizontal shear force and this is vertical shear force, people say. Don't worry, all are one and the same. Okay, uh, their action is same. Only whether it is vertical or horizontal, it's only your perception. If you rotate it, the horizontal shear force becomes the vertical shear force and the vertical shear force becomes the horizontal shear force. Okay. This shear force, what it will do is roughly, I'll give you, it changes the shape. Shape change. Shear force changes the shape. Axial force, elongation, that is extension or um, compression. Compression means change, decrease in the length. Okay, so these are the two forces. And you are having, let me put the same body again. And let me tell you the action of the other forces. Okay, say for example, if you are having a block like this and you are having the axis like this. Okay, so if I apply a moment about this axis, if I apply moment about this axis, already I have told you the moment, put your four fingers in the, put your thumb in the direction of the double arrow and try to hold this axis. That is nothing but the moment that you apply like this. This is called bending moment, which tries to bend the body. Okay, so similarly, if I apply the moment in this direction, M, okay, so that this block tries to bend this in this direction and this is bending moment. We call this as bending moment about x-axis. This is bending moment about y-axis. Okay? So one is bending moment about x-axis, the bending moment about y-axis. Say, for example, if you are having the same block, this block is uh, acted upon by moment in this direction, let us say. Okay, so that is called the put the thumb in the direction of these two and try to rotate this. That means you are applying a couple in this direction. So this is called twist or Torsion. Don't say the word twist. Twist is for angle. Torsion. This is torsion. Okay. So therefore, uh, what happens or what type of uh, deformations take place due to torsion, due to bending, bit, um, due to shear, and due to axial force? These things we will be studying in strength of materials. See, these are the only six possibilities of applying a force on a body. There is no other way of applying any other force. Okay. 
so whatever that happens to the body if you subject the body to rise in temperature we will convert that into axons say for example if a body is subjected to shrinkage we will convert that into a force like this we will convert them into any of these forces whatever the external agency that will cause no disturbance to the structure will convert them into any of these force and we handle the problem okay so that's why what happens when these six forces are acting on a body you have to know individually and in combination say for example they are having axial force and shear some bodies may be subjected to axial force as well as shear some bodies may be subjected to bending moment shear force and axial force and some may be subjected to torsion bending moment axial force and shear force so like that any any number of combinations you can have but finally the members are subjected to this six forces only okay so therefore in strength of materials we understand what happens for this individual forces okay individual forces separately first we will see the axial force okay so when a body is subjected to axial force say for example you are having a body which is subjected to axial force okay so from now onwards um, we will say axial force is p okay so one thing the internal distance between two particles increase is increase the distance between two particles increase okay say for example if the same body is subjected to force in the other direction that is if we apply force like this okay so then what happens the internal distance between two particles here it is increasing here it is decreasing is it not okay so now what is that we say is the internal if the internal if the force tends to increase the internal distance between two particles in the line of action of the force then it is called a tension why i am saying in the line of action of the force means if i apply force in this direction the diameter may decrease the height may decrease is it not this height may decrease or this width may decrease so therefore i cannot say that this force is a compressive force okay so the tensional force is defined as it is a force which tries to increase the internal distance between two particles in the direction of the force similarly this is the compressive force compressive force means uh, the internal distance between two particles in the direction of the force decreases then it is the compressive force okay so mathematically both are one and the same because uh, it's only one is plus the other is minus okay mathematically both are one and the same but as far as action is concerned design is concerned both are totally different compression and tension both are different the reason already i have told you that say for example if you are having a cable a cable means it take a rope okay so a rope can be subjected to axial tension but we cannot apply a compressive force on rope okay so therefore mm, as far as strength of materials are, is concerned or uh, mechanics solid mechanics is concerned the tension and compression are totally different they have to be handled on a separate footing okay so now let me sir, consider yes sir in second diagram while you are applying compression force okay sir in what sir compression force will be applicable only for the length because sir if we apply the compression force then the breadth and height will be acting as a tension force it will that is, that is what i am saying that is what i am saying even for the second member also so what happens say if i apply this compressive force this width increases this depth may increase this width also increases because of the poisson's effect so that's why compressive force how it is defined if the internal distance between two particles in the direction of the force decrease then the corresponding force is called the compressive force in the direction because if i apply force in this direction definitely the distance between these two particles won't increase that has to decrease only is it not yes sir. yes sir okay so uh, 
see the compression tension has a lot of differences as far as strength of materials is concerned okay but in engineering mechanics both are one and the same whether you pull or push both are one and the same okay <clears throat> so now uh, let me see when i am speaking about the deformations okay so the material comes into the picture the term material comes into the picture because uh, some materials have a tendency to deform quickly they are flexible like a rubber band so if you apply a small tensile force it expands more or it deforms more okay like a steel or uh, you use thick glass okay so if you apply force the deformations are very very small so therefore the material is coming into the picture so therefore what is that they have done is they have drawn a graph between the force p and the deformation delta that means what is that you have to do take a bar any bar it can be it can be a wooden bar or a steel bar or a concrete bar or anything glass bar whatever it is apply force p it deforms delta okay so this response is linear it is assumed to be linear micro cracks are present it this is non linear but let us not think much about it it is linear and this slope is called stiffness okay so the slope is called stiffness and the area is called energy absorbed okay so area is is energy absorbed p is the force axial force delta is the deformation okay so then <clears throat> they have introduced the term stress see this is the stress uh, strain they are to uh, they are required to Um, remove the cross sectional effects to the maximum extent possible so this p divided by the cross sectional area if a is the cross sectional area of this object or this bar p by a is called stress if it is a tensile stress it is a if it is a tensile force it is a tensile stress or if it is uh, the compressive force p by a is called the compressive stress this stress has got much meaning okay it is the internal resistance offered okay so the stress you cannot measure you cannot measure this stress only you can calculate like radius radius you cannot measure radius you can calculate diameter you can measure is it not so like that the stress cannot be measured but you can calculate the stress the expression for stress is p by a if p is the axial force acting on the body okay if a is the cross sectional area of the body then axial stress is given by p by a the axial stress can be tensile stress or compressive stress okay so um, if i take this term this axial stress p by a okay so if p by a reaches a particular value called the yield stress the body fails that is one theory of failure or one rule of failure you can take it for granted for some time okay so therefore the body deforms so once the body deforms if l is the length then delta by l is called the strain of course normal strain okay so the normal strain is delta by l the normal strain can be again tensile strain 
compressor strain. How you define strain? Strain is the ratio of deformation to the original length of the body in the direction of the force. Okay, in the direction of the force is called strain. Is it clear? Say, for example, if you are having a body, a bar subjected to axial tension, and if you know P is the force. Okay, so what happens if you apply the gradual increments of load P, there will be extension, delta. Okay, so the, you draw a graph between this P and delta. Okay, already I have told you linear. But what happens is mm, this same, if, 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 say for example, if I take a larger bar, a bar of higher diameter, I will be getting more force. If I take a bar of lower diameter, I will be getting less force for failure. Is it not? So therefore, to remove that cross-sectional effect, we will use the term P by A, that is called stress. So let me draw a, between, a graph between stress and delta L by L strain. Okay, so if you draw a stress versus strain curve for mild steel, initially it is linear. Initially, it is linear. Okay, so uh, after the, uh, some load, what happens is it loses linearity. Linearity is it is losing means there will be some internal cracks in the. Okay, so therefore, non-linearity it goes with reduced modulus of elasticity or with reduced slope. Okay, or with reduced stiffness. Okay, so then what happens is there will be drop. Okay, so there will be extension and of course this is the general mild steel behavior. Some ob um, bodies may not touch this or they may fail here itself. Some may fail here, some may fail here and generally this is the mild steel that gives uh, this type of behavior. Okay, so this point is called, uh, up to this point, the material is, point A is called limit of proportionality. Okay, so then uh, it becomes nonlinear. This is called, up to this point, the point B, it is um, it is nonlinear, but elastic. Elastic means uh, uh, even if you remove the load at this point, the strain becomes zero. Okay, so um, this is called lower yield point. Okay, just slightly, you can say B itself as, okay, um, slightly above B or slightly, let, let me say this B is uh, somewhere here. C is upper yield point. And D is lower yield point. So at the C and D, if you remove the load, the deformations will be there in this member. Okay, so then it undergoes large strain without increasing any stress or without increasing any load. So afterwards, what happens is there it requires additional stress for additional strain. It requires additional stress for additional strain. And that point E is called strain hardening. Okay, this strain hardening may be present or may be absent in some materials. Okay, so then 
you will have this upper yield point. So this is a sorry, um, ultimate stress. Okay, so let us say F. ultimate stress. Thereafter, what happens is the diameter of the bar starts getting reduced. So once the diameter of the bar starts getting reduced, the stress is going to be increased, but the calculated stress, that is P by A, based on the original area, starts decreasing. So therefore, there will be reduction in the stress. And at this stage, the breaking takes place. So at the G, breaking stress means it fails. Okay. So these are the different um, stages in case of mild steel. Okay. So all our calculations, they stop here. All our calculations, they stop here. Okay. So this stress is called yield stress. Practically, we assume that the material behaves something like this. Okay. Okay. So this is yield stress. The upper portion, remaining portion is safety only. Okay. Don't worry about that. And to this, we apply a factor of safety and we say this is working stress. So working stress is equal to yield stress divided by factor of safety. This factor of safety is called our ignorance. Okay. So factor of safety is more means you are more ignorant about the material. Factor of safety is less means you are less ignorant about the behavior of the material. Okay. Generally, if it is concrete, we take a factor of safety of three for concrete. Okay. It is uh, 1.5 generally for steel. The material is homogeneous. Then we use a factor of safety of 1.5. Concrete like things where uh, uh, the steel is a factory product. Concrete is not a factory product. Okay. So moreover, uh, the different materials, they combine in concrete. Okay. Like coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, okay, chips, sand, etc., etc. So therefore, we apply a factor of safety of three. Say, for example, if it is going to be five, if it is a brickwork, okay, um, it, it may go up to 10 in case of uh, rubble mass and rework. Rubble mass and rework means, so, okay. A rock mass and reworks. Okay. So, because uh, you have less information about this and you are having more information about this steel. So, that's why the factor of safety is 1.3. Okay. So, however, whether you take 1.5 or 10, Within this working range, you can take the stress versus strain relation as linear and the slope is called modulus of elasticity. This speaks about the material. Sir? Yes? Once, please explain again what is yield stress. Yield stress means, um, practically speaking, okay, so where you don't require any additional stress, and you will have continuous strain. Strain will be increased without any means without any increase in stress or the force, the deformation takes place. Means if you are applying the uh, force P here, okay. Say for example, if your P is equal to P by, the bar starts yielding more, more, and more. Okay, yielding means it is a deforming without any additional stress. Okay, so generally deformations are dangerous. And deformations are measurable. See, stress is not measurable. This delta is measurable. Okay? So, 
two or three new terms we have come across that is stress roughly you can take this is p by f for axially loaded elements strain is equal to delta l by l that is the change in length by original length in the direction of the force and the third one is the modulus of elasticity which speaks about the material that is uh, sigma by epsilon generally this is related by denoted by the letter epsilon this is denoted by the letter uh, sigma okay sigma by epsilon is uh, the modulus of elasticity e or p by a divided by delta l by l is equal to e this changes from material to material this gives me delta l is equal to p l by a e that means if you take a member and if you apply the axial load axial force increases deformations increase keeping the axial load constant if you increase the length of the member deformations increase okay keeping these two things constant if you decrease the cross sectional area deformations increase keeping these three things in constant if you change the modulus of elasticity if you decrease the modulus of elasticity delta l increases so therefore whether to increase delta l or not whether to increase the deformations or not for a given load is within your hand is it clear so i'll uh, close this session today okay so tomorrow i'll continue the remaining part of the strength of materials the strength of materials is very interesting okay so try to uh, understand the principles of this because they are very very important okay so tomorrow we will have a class at 8:00 uh, o'clock and i want to have one more minor because six minors i have to conduct for 60 mark okay so i think the centroids and moment of inertia can i club that into one minor yes you discuss among yourself and uh, come out with a solution tomorrow okay so i am closing the session uh, when are you going to conduct like uh, approximate date next week this minor time before end some exam sir only two topics because see i have to evaluate you for 60 marks right yes sir Fifty are internals, forty are externals, right? Sir, objective exam. MCQ or uh, sir, uh, descriptive type. Uh, I'll put the short answer questions as far as this. Uh, um, small small calculations will be there. Hand calculations will be there. Our calculator calculations, and you can put the answer. Okay, so like that we will conduct the test. Short answer questions only. Ten questions will be given. Ten answers. Okay. Like we did in minor one. Yes, like minor one, because we'll have one minor one type and one minor two type, right? Both the examinations we'll have. Okay. Okay. Sir, share the so, notes, sir. Ah, uh, yeah. Actually, these three classes I have to share. Okay, I'll share it. Okay. Oh, sir, when will you grade us for minor?